Thanks. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you so very much for uh, being here. Uh, again, we want to try to do this once a week. Uh, we want to take and be able to supply to you uh, information that you want to hear about. So this is not a not a, uh, a, a commercial from us, uh, but it's a diver to diver talk. So. Uh, and I've been very lucky to be in the right place at the right time and have some incredible experiences and opportunities to participate in uh, world breaking uh, or new things as most of you know. So anyway, I, whatever we talk about on this period of time, I want it to be what you want to hear about. So, so send in your recommendations, suggestions and desires and um, Anyway, what I have often said when I give presentations, I, whenever you have a question, ask me. Uh, I may not know the answer, but I probably know who does. And if, if you give me the, the, your question, I'll go find out the answer for you and get it back to you. Uh, and again, any, much as Jack has just said, uh, anything you want to hear about or know about uh, for future uh, uh, meetings uh, like this, uh, send your questions to support at the DiveDUI.com. Anyway, we're going to be here for about an hour. Um, and what I want to know from you now is what would you like to know at the end of that hour that you don't know now? So if you can let, let me know what that is, uh, I'm going to be talking, giving you a presentation for about 30 minutes. Then, then we've got about 30 minutes to go to answer any kind of a questions you have. So I would like you to leave here knowing something you don't know now. So uh, uh, okay, uh, very good. Now let me get on to my other thing. Okay, uh, from my perspective, uh, I, I got out of the Army as 20 years old in 1957. Uh, I moved to San, uh, San Jose, uh, right up there in, in uh, Central California, and I was working in a furniture factory. Uh, I would go to the beach on the weekends. I used to call it the getting sand in my shoes. Um, I didn't know why I was there, but I was there. I also was a science fiction movie buff. I really liked science fiction movies. So I saw they were having a double feature and one of the movies was called Silent World. It was the first movie on in that section and I was just blown away. That's Jacques Cousteau's Silent World and it was all of course about diving. And I, I was so excited about it. My roommate had the car. Uh, I, I was I living in a boarding house at the time. Uh, he had a car. I made him sit through the, the Silent World twice. Uh, he was a good guy. Um, and then uh, I went fishing in a uh, artificial lake, a man-made lake there in San Jose, and I lost uh, a fishing lure uh, that made by uh, is given to me by uh, my uncle, and I, it it broke my heart. And I was sitting there cursing about it. And this guy said, well, you know where it is. It's caught in the barbed wire fence. I said, what barbed wire fence? And the guy said, that barbed wire fence. And he showed me a, a, a barbed wire fence up the street that in turn came down into the water and ran down and apparently right in front of me. So I went to an army surplus store. I bought a face mask with two snorkels attached to it, to the mask, uh, for $1.95. And I bought a pair of swim fins for $1.98. And I went down into the, the uh, uh, lake and I not only found my fishing lure, I found everybody else's fishing lure there with it. So I collected them all off the barbed wire fence, went along the beach and there and uh, the shoreline and I sold those fishing lures for 25 cents a piece and made back my four bucks for my study and I was really, really excited. I went to work uh, in the furniture factory. I told the guys there, uh, about my excitement and this one guy said, hey, what'd you wear, a dry suit or a wetsuit? I said, oh, I wore a bathing suit. <laughs> I'd never heard of a wetsuit or a dry suit. So I said, uh, come with me this next weekend. I took him out there, he was totally unimpressed. And most of the fishing lures left were the ones that were all rusted. Anyway, he said, come with me this next weekend to Monterey. So I went with him to Monterey. Uh, I went in the water, we had like six foot visibility on that day. Uh, uh, I used his wetsuit, which was way too big for me because I was a tall, skinny guy at the time, and I fell in love. I mean, I just, I found why I exist on the face of the earth. Anyway, uh, that just turned me loose. Uh, so anyway, I, at that time, they didn't have dive stores, nothing like we have today. And the only dive shops that existed were in the basements of 
guy's houses uh, and it was a little small place and they would sell masks and circles and things of that nature. And anyway, a guy named Stan Sheely uh, uh, had such a shop and, and he could fill tanks and uh, uh, he made wetsuit kits. And so I was married at the time, I had a baby on the way. And so I worked through my vacation and but the baby got half the money and I got the other half the money to to make this uh, wetsuit kit. I think I paid $25 for it at the time. Uh, anyway, and and so I was putting the, the, the wetsuit together on my kitchen floor and the first thing I did was spill the black glue all over the floor. My wife was not accepting, ex happy about that at all. Anyway, uh, we the, my first weight belt was made uh, from an armage cartridge belt, so it had no quick release on it. Uh, the furniture factory I was working in had uh, these little short pieces of uh, wrought iron that they made furniture out of. And so I put those in the weight pouches of the weight pouch, and, and that was my first weight belt. Um, I, I made an, uh, I used a 17 inch inner tube uh, and put a, uh, a gunny sack around it that uh, plumbing parts came in. And uh, that, that was what we had. Uh, in fact, here you see a picture of me, uh, this before and after, I guess. Uh, in this case, particular case, we made our own lead weights, and we made them out of melting tire weights. When people would bring their, their tires in to be uh, replaced, they would take the old weights off of them and throw them in a bucket. And then uh, we would go in and get the bucket of lead weights, melt them down, and then make our own weights. And you can see there, my, my quick release buckle is back on the side. So we weren't, weren't very good about that sort of thing. Anyway, um, uh, after that, I became an apprentice sheet metal worker. I built a spear gun out of ferrous metal. It worked on one dive, and it, the salt water froze it. And then I took a, a threw that, I worked, worked for two weeks on that thing. Then I threw it away. I got a broomstick, a frog gig, and a piece of surgical tubing, and I was a hunter. And uh, in those days, we didn't have uh, compressed air. Or, or I didn't have access to press air. Anyway, um, uh, then uh, diving instruction as it exists today, or as it is today, didn't exist. C cards didn't weren't weren't in 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 existence yet. So uh, uh, the dive clubs gave uh, instruction, and we had a, a book called Diving Safety made by E.R. Cross, uh, written by E.R. Cross. He was a World War II uh, hard hat diver. Uh, uh, anyway, um, so so that that that's where we got started. Then uh, we had Skin Diver Magazine, and we read Skin Diver Magazine cover to cover. I mean, it was like our Bible. Uh, it was just full of adventures, and of course, we all wanted to go. At the same time, uh, in our particular case, we had uh, uh, whenever you, if seven, anybody said anything about uh, Tuesday night at seven o'clock, uh, that was when Sea Hunt was on. Nobody missed Sea Hunt. Now, this particular one, they have it on Wednesday, wherever, wherever this one came from, but in my case up in San Jose, it was on Tuesday night at seven o'clock. And of course, we thought Lloyd Bridges could walk on water if he really wanted to. Uh, the, uh, uh, then I went uh, to the Monterey jet Jetty. Uh, I borrowed a scuba tank and a, a scuba regulator. And I was all by myself. I went out there. I used a parachute cord on my float and had a salmon weight on it. Well, the salmon weight got caught in the rocks. So I started to go down. And as a result, never used uh, parachute cord for a uh, anchor weight because it gets you get all tangled up in the thing and, and I got all tangled up in the thing the the cord knocked my mask flooded it and there I was tangled up with my mask flooded and I said oh my god I think I'm this is a problem then I remember having read in the, in the magazine that if you put your fingers at the top of your mask leaned your head back and blew air out of your nose the water would go out of your mask and so that's what I did. And the most surprised guy in the whole world was me when the water went out of the mask. Then I could untangle myself and came back in and said, well, that was one of those adventures I'm, I'm never going to forget. Anyway, uh, we, we were making, it, that led us into making scuba rigs out of anything. And for instance, we would take old fire extinguishers, take the valves out because they were a half inch pipe thread, 
put uh, diving valves in, but they were really uh, super negative. We never bother even think about any CO2 in the metal coming out into the air we were breathing. Uh, after that, we found that uh, you had uh, 38 cubic foot cylinders that were used on, uh, on uh, uh, combat aircraft. And they had hundreds and hundreds of these things in the, in the surplus yards. So we would take those, uh, they were wrapped with wire on the outside of them, so in case a bullet hit them, they didn't ex explode. Um, and uh, we made double 38s of it. So for years, uh, in especially in Southern California, we had all kinds of double 38 uh, cylinders. Um, uh, okay, by, the, by this time, Stan Sealy decided he wanted to open a real live, honest to God, dive store with air compressor and all of that. So he invited me to become his partner. Uh, he said he never met anybody so excited about diving as I was, and he never saw anybody that worked so hard as I was willing to work. At that time, on the wall, I had eight different face masks. Eight different face masks. As far as I know, they were all the face masks that were being offered on the market at that time. So if you can imagine that, there were only eight of them. Also, just up the road from us uh, in San Rafael, uh, there was a guy named Roger Hess up there, and he was writing Instructor Corner for Skidaver Magazine. And what he was doing was, was passing information back from one, one instructor to another. Um, and, and he felt that, that, and at that time in the summertime, we would lose a, a diver um, uh, too often in Monterey. So we, we, people just didn't know what they were doing. And that included me, by the way. Anyway, so he got together, the, the, the Red Cross had a, a diving instruction program in Florida. Uh, the YMCA had a program somewhere up in the, on the East Coast. And then you had LA County had a really good instructor program in LA. They decided that they would come together and create a new national organization and create a set of standards that everyone would teach to. Uh, uh, Roger wanted to call it the National Diving Patrol uh, after the National Ski Patrol. But a lot of the divers didn't like that idea. So anyway, they convinced him to call it the National Association of Underwater Instructors and voila, now he was born. So I, in 1960, I went to the first uh, uh, certification course ever. And I ended up being instructor number 49 because they handed out C cards at the time uh, by alphabetical order. So that's how I ended up being now an instructor 49. And that also tells you why I'm one of the few divers you know that doesn't have a C card. Because when I started diving, C cards didn't exist. So uh, uh, when we did our first uh, 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 in-water test, they, for instance, had us do a standard ditch and dawn. Those of you who started diving years ago know exactly what that is. Um, then what they had was us do was uh, they had us take a scuba tank without a regulator on it. We were underwater. We would crack the valve of the, uh, they were all K valves at the time. We would crack that valve and we would breathe off the bubbles coming out of the tank. And we had to swim around this huge Olympic swimming pool uh, in, a, in a full circle doing that just to show we had the kind of, of cool heads to do that. At the time, we all had two hose regulators. So what we did was we had one guy with a scuba regulator on. I mean, with a scuba rig on, and then the other diver would have a funnel, and we would swim directly over the top of the first scuba diver, and we would catch his bubbles coming out of his regulator in the funnel, then we would breathe off of those bubbles, and we had to swim all the way around that huge Olympic swimming pool uh, there at the, uh, at the Hyatt Regency in, uh, in, Houston, in Houston, Texas, uh, doing that. But we had good water skills those days. I mean, the people who were uh, diving, we had good water skills. So that sort of thing wasn't all that big, uh, 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 all that big deal. One of the other things we had to do was, and remember, we're in bathing suits, and we had to wear a 20-pound weight belt, and and tread water for 20 minutes. Now I had duck feet. And if you've ever seen the super extra large duck feet, they're huge fins. And I was one of the few guys to be able to make that full 20 minutes. Um, uh, anyway, so 
uh, that's how I became a Naui instructor. I went back to San Jose and I was going in the water uh, with, with my kit wetsuit on and I was freezing to death. If any of you ever wanna wonder why and how I ever got involved in the thermal protection business, it wasn't for you, it wasn't to make money, it's because I was freezing to death. I remember one day crawling out of the water at uh, Monastery Beach I was so cold I couldn't even stand up. When I finally could stand up, I went and got in my car and I sat in there for two hours with a car running until I could get warm enough to be able to drive home. And I remember at the end of that on the way home, I said, Dick, you just can't keep doing this and not hurt yourself. You're gonna, it, this is stupid to be doing this. So I said, you know, nobody else is trying to do anything with this. So you might as well try. So the result of that was I went to quarter inch rubber Again, we didn't have nylon lining in those days. I, I went, I created Farmer John pants. We then attached the boots to the bottom of the legs. They were really hard to put on, but it was worth the effort. Uh, and then we attached the hood to the jacket and you didn't have any zippers. So you had to put a lot of cornstarch on it or, or talcum powder in order to be able to slide into this thing. Also, if you, uh, if you, there's a picture there somewhere of me uh, holding the inner tube. Uh, if you could see that picture clearly, you would see in the arms, there would be uh, uh, seams here and seams here, because what we would do when you came out of the water, you would cross your arms like this. You, you would cross your arms like this and you would then hold your, your, your dive partner's legs. And, and then he would reach behind you and grab your, your your, uh, the bottom of your jacket and then start pulling it off. Well, as long as you were wet on the outside, then that water re uh, created a, a lubricant and you would like skinning a rabbit, you just plop, pop that thing off. The problem is when you pop the thing off, I'd turn around and say, don't you wanna take the arms with it? And you could always tell how much diving was going on in any given weekend by how much powder you sold, talcum powder, and how much glue you sold because you see guys down the beach glue their wetsuit back together again before they could go in the water. Dick, can I get you to move your microphone back up? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, that's my, my director, sir. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Anything you say, sir. Okay, anyway, we also, um, uh, I saw uh, there, they used to have a, a, a TV show called Wagon Train, and they had a scout on there who had his knife on the side of his leg. And I said, you know, that really looks cool. And I figured a way to glue that thing on the outside of my wetsuit. And to this day, we now have divers all over the world having the knife. As far as I know, I was the first guy to do it. I was the first guy to ever make the Farmer John pants. In fact, the, the president of, um, of Parkways used to come out and visit me at least once a year because he was selling wetsuits. He says, I know I'm not gonna sell you wetsuits here, but he said, I always wanna come here to, to see what the state of the art is. And of course I was just, my head just got big around. Anyway, we would make floats out of, of plywood and fiberglass. Uh, and, uh, but we found that the best floats we had were 12 foot tandem, uh, tandem surfboards that would hold weight. You could put uh, a box on the, on the thing, hold it down with bungee cords and uh, put all your gear inside there and go out to the surf. They, they were really marvelous. Um, then I decided to move to San Diego in 1963. And I did that because of two things. Number one, the water was warmer, quite a bit warmer. And the second thing was that um, uh, they had lobsters. They had lobsters. And that, that and it, all the lobsters wouldn't open all year long. And they had that, and we had abalone in Northern California. When I first came to San Diego, uh, uh, scuba classes were 12 hours of part uh, pool, part uh, lecture, uh, half and half on a, on a given, given evening, and they had one ocean dive. Well, uh, remember, I started off in Naui, and uh, you know the, 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 the thing there is safety through education. So I started off my courses here with five ocean dives. The first two ocean dives were diver meet ocean, ocean meet diver. No weight belts, no tanks, nothing, just bass snorkels, fins, and wetsuits. The last three dives were uh, uh, with scuba gear. Then we, uh, and we charged $25. Now we had a deal with the La Mesa swimming pool. They let us use their swimming pool without charge. We didn't have to have liability insurance in those days, but, but we taught a full 
class for $25. Then we would once a month, we, there was an old fishing boat that a guy had charged uh, that had converted called the Duchess. And, and he had an air compressor on it. And uh, I think we were paying $12 for a boat trip to the Coronado Islands. And we'd do that once a month. And the Coronado Islands at that time was full of game. And of course, we were all big time spear fishermen. Um, we used to say, say we measure our fun in gross tonnage. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, we would have abalone fries at the end of the, of the classes. Uh, and, and then we turned them and, and then we would take them diving with us for a number of dives uh, afterwards until they got uh, confident enough in their own skills that they could go off on their own. We built our instructional program up to where we were teaching both uh, 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 on military bases, uh, and then we were teaching uh, also in, the, in several pools around the city. At the height of our time, which was probably about 1973, four, we were teaching up to 200 students a month in the summertime. So that gives you an idea how far that, that grew. Uh, uh, and, and also uh, in the, between 63 and 70, we were big time in competition divers. But once we started winning them all, we quit. It just wasn't challenging anymore. I don't know. But also we learned that the big fish, which was what we hunted all the time, they're the ones that lay all the fish eggs, uh, not the little fishes. And, uh, and the same thing with lobsters. And I haven't caught a lobster in at least 25 years, to give you an idea how that kind of changes you. Anyway. Uh, when I came to San Diego, San Diego, one of the reasons I chose San Diego was because they had more Navy divers in San Diego than anywhere else in the world. You had three underwater demolition teams, then you had the ship husbandry people uh, uh, who did all the ship repair work they did. Uh, and I had a former frogman who was a salesman now for one of the dive companies. He took me over and introduced me to the teams, and that was team 12, 11, 12, and 13. Uh, over in Coronado. And I started making wetsuits for them. They had a, a wetsuit that was made out of 3 sixteenths material. The waist, uh, the thing come up to the waist, uh, the pants come up to the waist. They had five zippers, one in each arm, one in each leg, and one down the front. And they had a separate hood. Uh, and that's what they wanted. That's what I made them. Then they had me go over to their research development test evaluation group, which is a very long name for a very small group of guys. Uh, and they said they have a new guy there. They want me to make a wetsuit for him. So I go over there. Uh, they're not in the building. It's a little Quonset hut. Uh, I then walked out. And you can see the guys out in the end of the pier. So I walked out on the end of the pier. And here they had two guys carrying a third guy between them. And I said, I'm Dick Long, do you, I'm here to measure a suit. I said, by the way, what's wrong with that guy? And he said, he's cold. And I said, you know, he's a big bad frogman. I probably weigh a whole 140 pounds, but I could capture him, you know. And, and the chief said, okay, just go back. So when we got back inside the building, he said, uh, I, I said, look, if you guys will give me $200, I will build you a suit that will last, they, they told me that they had a six hour boat. The boat had battery power to go for six hours, but they only had an hour and a half man. At the end of the hour and a half, they had to pull the guy out of the boat because he couldn't stay there any longer. So I said, look, if you will give me $200, I'll make you a suit that I guarantee you will double that time or you don't pay for it. And the guy said, oh yeah? I said, yeah. And he said, the chief petty officer said, his name was Gator Parks. He, Gator said, make two, one for you, and one for this guy. I said, okay, so I show up a week later, I've got the suit, I dress out in it, I took the other guy, get him dressed out on, in it, and, and so then we walk out on, under the pier, and I say, and, and the little SDV, uh, uh, it, it was one, it, it looked like a World War II airplane where you had a canopy that pulled in over the top of you. And he said, uh, I, I said, okay, look, I'll be back in three hours, you pay for the suits, because at that time they had the money, they could pay for them themselves. And the guy said, get in the boat. I, I said, what do you mean? You, 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 you want me to get in the boat? Yeah, big mouth. I said, get in the boat. And I turned around and behind me was three of the biggest, baddest looking frog men you ever saw in your life. And I said, I think you want me to get in the boat. Yeah, now. So we climbed down in the boat. 
We get in there, they tow us out into the bay. And what they did was they had us swim and uh, uh, drive in one direction on a compass course for so many minutes, then make a right angle turn, go for the same period of time, then make a right angle turn. So what we did was going in a square. The guy that was, was, I was in there with, uh, had never done this before. We kept hitting the bottom and the boat would fill up with mud so much so that even though his, his back was against my chest, I had to reach up to make sure he was still there. At about an hour and a half, an M80 went off. The, the M80 is a firecracker they use for simulating uh, weapons going off. Anyway, that went off. We came to the surface. The chief petty officer says, hey, uh, how are you doing? And the guy driving the boat says, hey, you know, I, I'm trying to get the hang of this, but I keep hitting the bottom. He says, yeah, no, we know wherever you are because we can see the plume of mud behind you. So he said, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, he said, okay, go down. So we went down again about an hour later. Another M80 went off and we came to the surface and they pulled us up into the little uh, uh, device that they could uh, haul the SDV in at high speeds. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so. Uh, I said, hey, wait a minute. Look, we only got 30 minutes to go. Do you have to pay for these suits? And the guy says, you're going to get paid. You're going to get paid. But obviously, you know something we don't know. And I want to know what that is. And that started a relationship with the Navy. First of all, those guys, which were this rdt &E unit, became the safety standby divers for C-Lab 2. And if you ever read about C-Lab 2, they, they had to do some special stuff for them. And I ended up being their go-to guy to solve a problem. Whenever they had a problem, they're supposed to be supported by the Navy, but the Navy never did. So they would give it to me. I'd go find it, find the answer to them, bring it back to the device or whatever it was, or fix the device, whatever it was, give it back to them. So when the C-Lab pro came, they took me with them. In fact, as you know, C-Lab 2 had a lot of problems. And so one day they, they, they called me over there for a meeting. I go in and we're out on the Bracconi, which was the, the vessel the sh ship was on. And you had the C-Lab guys on one side of the table. We had, we, we had the UDT guys on the other side of the table. And the, UD guy, the head of the UDT detachment says, um, uh, gentlemen, this is Dick Long. He always solves all, all of our problems. So you just give him yours and he, we're sure he can solve yours too. I said, wait a minute, this is saturation diving. I don't know anything about helium. I don't know anything about anything. Anyway, uh, their, their big problem was they had three teams each underwater for 15, 14 days apiece. And the average time per man per day outside was 15 minutes. Within 15 minutes, these hardcore, rough, tough, top shaped divers were bathed into a wimple wimping blow a bowl of jello i mean they were totally incapacitated and therefore the thermal problems for the saturation diving became their big thing and after that is when i got into uh, uh, i did some reading and whatnot and i found out about there was a frenchman one time made a hot water suit uh and that's where i got started hot water suits but that's uh, for a subject of another day so uh, at this moment, I am actually at my 30 minutes. I got, I got two things I want to show you. Two things here. Hold on. Years ago, I met a physicist named Cal Gonworth. He's not with us anymore. Uh, well, of course, I'm 82, so most of the guys that I grew up with weren't. And he came up with this pair of fins. He had, he, he had a, uh, this is just a tennis shoe to put it on to make it work. And you had the fin come out, and there's a torsion bar here. It has a spring in it, okay? And you had two of them. And they sat like this, one in front of the other. And when you, when you swam, you made these fins go back and forth in this nature. The result is, and actually they work, they really do. You get more thrust out of this. And he was a, an old guy and not very powerful, but he swam uh, from Long Beach to uh, Catalina just to prove the point. And, and he had, uh, he, the one he used there was the Aquion, which works on the same, the, the same kind of a fin principle here. This, this thing really does work. The problem you have is, is that when you're kicking, you keep banging into one another because we don't kick our fins. Uh, we, our fins aren't one in front of the other, they're, they're side by side. So that, 
this thing never went anywhere. But it's, uh, and again, each of these blades have a torsion bar in it so that, that it, uh, when you're kicking against water, it guides the water. Anyway, that's, that's something that uh, I like to get into weird things. And so uh, if somebody wants to try something new, I want to do it. Okay. The next one is dry suits in the very beginning, dry suits in the very beginning were made of latex rubber and they covered your, your, your body, but they had a, a tunnel that went in the chest. And the, the, um, uh, what you did was you crawled in the tunnel, then you took the tunnel and you squished it all up in front, twisted it, and you closed it off with something that looked like this. This is a clamp. You'd push this onto the twisted rubber, put, hey, come on, Dick. Put this up like so. Uh, put the clamp, then turn this turn this screw down. And what you do is keeps crushing this thing until it it crushed all the rubber so tight together it wouldn't leak. The problem is you couldn't put air in it. You always knew when you hit 50 feet in one of those dry suits because your voice went up several octaves. Okay, they had no way to put air in and, and no, no way to put, let air out. And the earlier, later on, we found a way to put air in and then we would grab the, the next seal and pull it out to let air out when you're coming up. Anyway, I just wanted to show you some of the stuff that I've got around. Uh, now, we're gonna, have, uh, uh, we're gonna wanna talk about uh, uh, future um, uh, talks. Uh, if you wanna know about hot water suits, I can tell you a lot about those. You wanna talk about ships to reefs, uh, you know, we sank the Yukon out here, me and 2,500 other guys uh, did that. At one time, um, when dry suits, I'm sorry, yes, when dry suits first started, people didn't know how, what kind of insulation to wear. And also you have different sized people. Little people get colder than big people do. So we created something we call thermal guidelines. Decompression tables are a mathematical model that tells you uh, uh, the deeper you go, as you go down, you take on inert gas. Then the tables also tell you how, how slow you have to come back up to let the gas come out through your natural um, processes or you're gonna get the bends. In our case, in thermal guidelines, we said we can tell you if we know the sex you are, the age you are, the size you are, and whether you're hot or cold-blooded normally, uh, we can tell you either A, how much insulation you need to stay in thermal equilibrium or how miserable you're going to get and how long it's going to take you to get there. And we had, it, and it was called literally the misery index. And uh, in fact is uh, the Navy picked it up and they made another, another system for them, for their own people. Uh, they thought it was so good. Anyway, uh, I can also talk to you about dry suit development. We went through a lot of stuff before we got to where we are today. I was also involved uh, during World War II. During World War II, the, the, the Russians bought a lot of war material from the United States. We sent them planes and guns and all kinds of things. They paid for it with gold. And of course, the Brits wanted us in there. So the Brits volunteered to transport the gold from Russia to the United States. One of their shipments of gold, which was worth about $100 million, was in the process of going through the Arctic when a German submarine came up behind it and put a torpedo into their rudders and, and crippled the ship. And a big battle in, in, in ensued behind that uh, between the Russians and the, I'm sorry, the Germans and the, uh, and the uh, uh, British. And the British finally, uh, and, and they, they stored the gold in the magazine where all the, the powder is because nobody is ever allowed to go there. And so what they, the, the Brits did, they, they put their dead on that ship and then they sunk it themselves in 800 feet of water. Well, in 1946, uh, I'm sorry, in 1944, they weren't able to uh, 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 go down that deep. Anyway, because of North Sea oil, uh, they did develop the operation to go that deep. And anyway, because my hot water suits were the only way they could do that, I got involved in that. And I can show you a bunch of stuff about that $800 million of gold. They, I did, I got a little bit of the, of the dollars out of it, but none of the gold. And probably the last thing I can say is we at one time were in the helium unscrambler business. And I can tell you 
about that. Th these are just, uh, what, six things that I can, I can talk about in the future. I want to hear from you. What do you want to hear about? What do you want to learn about? I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time, and I met some incredible people, including Jacques Cousteau and, and his son, Philippe. Uh, so I got to be involved right in the beginning of a whole lot of neat stuff. Anyway, I'll be more than happy to share. I got a bunch of uh, artifacts and stuff from there. So anyway, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to my director. Okay, thanks, Dick. That was uh, awesome. Um, so I do have a few questions um, from some people. Um, the first one's from James Robertson. Um, and he wants to know how you feel, okay, I want to know, okay, how you feel about the current level standards, I assume of NAWI. It seems at times that instructors are parroting standards and not understanding why. Uh, do you think that the current standards are churning out people who think they know more than they do in the name of safety? <laughs> or is the current standards uh, viable or valuable? Um. I'm a bit hard-nosed on this subject, and I admit it, not a problem with it. When I started diving, we had to have good water skills to begin with, and, and that's not necessary for someone who wants to go to the Cayman Islands and dive with a, with a, uh, with a dive master. Um, in, in my world, we say there, there are divers, and then there are people who dive. People who dive are individuals who went through a scuba course, went on a vacation, went saw some pretty fishes and that was kind of it um where real divers uh hey doesn't matter what the visibility is in fact that's the first thing yes what is the fizz but we're going to get in the water anyway uh so i feel that that we have slipped a lot on standards we slipped a lot on a lot of things um and we we don't make divers anymore we simply make people who who can dive who could breathe underwater and not kill themselves but they're not divers they're not diverse at all. And, and I think that, and uh, I have talked to many people. Uh, in fact, I, 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 I worked with some people from GUE one time and they said, look, we, the people we're getting into our instructional program are nowhere near ready for just the basics of the basics. So we're willing to give to anyone who wants it, uh, all of our basic training standards uh, that they can have for free if they will just use them and apply them. And so the, uh, I believe that, that, I believe we're selling our students short when we don't, they came here to learn how to dive, guys. That's why they came to us. They wanted to learn how to dive. So by God, I think we ought to teach them to dive and we're not doing that. Is that clear enough? Yep, sounds good. Um, I have another one from uh, Seth. Um, he's wondering if, if you hold any patents on any diving innovations. Oh God, I've, I've had a bunch of patents over the years it's, and still have some. The, one of the ones we have running right now is zip seals. Uh, yes, we do. And whenever you have a patent, uh, I, I tell people, they say, well, we need to patent this or that. And, and I said, look guys, if you're gonna have a patent, then you gotta put $250,000 next to it because someone's gonna take and try to try to cheat on you and when they do you're going to have to file a suit against them so therefore uh uh patents are not are not necessarily what they used to be um they they're not necessarily what they used to be but uh, if i had to say how many patents do i have 25 something like that but most of them have expired i'm 82 years old now not 42 and, and the patents only last 17 years did I, you, do you think I answered this question? Yep. Um, so I have another one from Doug. Um, he says, you've, heard, I don't under, quite understand this. He, he heard you tried a gel filled wetsuit. How was oh, that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing I can talk to you about. We tried a lot of things. The uh, most wetsuits, well, all your wetsuits are, that we know today are made out of foam rubber. Well, rubber is actually a pretty good conductor conductor of heat actually if you could make a, a suit out of wood it would be a lot better it would be a lot more insulative but it doesn't bend very well so therefore they they, they take the air bubbles and they put them inside rubber but when you go down in the, in the uh, in the water column the deeper you go 
the smaller the bubbles become and therefore the more conductive the rubber becomes. So therefore what we wanted to do was find something that would not compress. So we used several things. One was microspheres. Uh, they use microspheres when they make syntactic foam to go on the outside of submarines because uh, you have these little round uh, glass bubbles and they won't crush. And they have thousands of them and they suspend them in urethane foam. We, we, we made uh, suits out of that. In fact, as we called it, whale blubber because the, the material that had it was, was a, a jellied mineral oil and, and the little uh, glass beads inside was, so we called it, and, and when you touch it, it was like whale blubber. And it, trying to create a structure that would simply hold it together. Uh, then we had one made out of a, 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 a urethane, but it was a really soft urethane. So it was uh, almost like uh, punching on jello. If you had a bowl full of gel and you put your fingers on the top of it and uh, we had, you would have the gel, you'd, you'd have the jello feeling to it. So we made suits out of that stuff. The, the one I liked best, which was the jelly mineral oil, uh, having the microspheres in it, that suit was about a half inch thick, weighed 40 pounds. But, uh, and, I, and I, weighed, I, I had a weight belt that weighed 40 pounds to go with it. Uh, but when I got down to 100 feet, I mean, let me tell you guys, there was no cold water there at all. I was, I was fat, dumb, and happy. Okay, I got another one from uh, Vince. Uh, what is your take on the plastic zippers uh, on the dry suits, I'm saying, versus probably the metal zippers? Okay, first of all, let me talk about metal zippers. There are a number of metal, number of metal zippers made around the world, a number of them in China. We have a zipper testing machine and it's uh, driven by uh, an air ram. And we, we mount the zipper in a panel, then bolt it into this uh, device. Then this air ram runs the zipper up and down for a hundred times and then puts air pressure behind it. Then if it holds air pressure, it backs off, does it a hundred times again, then pressurizes it, does a hundred times again, pressurizes it, so forth. So we run it, how many cycles can you run the zipper through before it breaks down? Uh, we found the YKK zippers are the only ones that will last, and the brass zippers, that they last the longest by far. Then you, and the, on the plastic zippers, there's several of them on the market today. And when we test a plastic zipper against a metal zipper, the plastic zipper will only last about a fourth of the number of cycles that, a, that we use YKK plastic zippers and because they're the best, they, they hold up the best. Then, uh, uh, and, and then we use, and, and we use the YKK metal zippers, but the plastic zippers will only last about 25% the life cycle of, of, of a, uh, uh, brass zipper. Now, many people think that the brass zipper wears out. Actually, brass zipper doesn't wear out. The tape, the zipper teeth are in is what wears out. And when you're running the zipper up and down, it causes a fraying of them. And, and a lot of people don't take very good care of them. You need to clean it. You need to lubricate it. Uh, and as long as you do that, uh, it's going to last you a long time. If you don't do that, it's going to last just a shorter period of time. So that, then also in the plastic zippers, you have... Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, uh, T-zip, T-zip, the, the plastic zipper in T-zip, you can bend in, in a curve a bit, where this, the, the zipper from YKK, you can't bend it. It's got to go in a straight line. Um, just as a side note for everyone, um, we've been working, uh, DY has been working with YKK on a new metal zipper tape. Um, and that's the tape that we are currently installing on uh, new, the newer made dry suits. Um, just to give you a clue, I've been, I've been diving it since May. Um, and during that time, I probably put in like, well, except for until this last month, um, probably about 150 dives on it. Um, and I've actually waxed the zipper four times. And you can hardly tell that there's wear on it. So there is innovation going on with the metal zippers. Um, so I have another question here for you, Dick. Um, it's yeah, we, from... we, we pound on YKK because those zippers cost a lot of money. Okay, so I got another question from uh, Michael Lewis. Um, he's asking if you're still advising the Navy. And he says his first trip was to Oceanside 
and his grandfather was retired as a USN captain in 1963 when you moved to San Diego. Um, <coughs> the answer to that question is yes. I'm afraid I'm red, white, and blue. And um, uh, we have guys out there who want to go places they can't go right now. And so we're working on some new systems that will allow them to go places they can't go right now. I really can't. I, I don't feel at liberty to tell you specifics about it. But let's just say that, that if, this, if this technology works, it's going to make your life better. And a lot of the things we've done before, um, the hot water suits and whatnot, that started with the military. And then what we did was uh, 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 modify that technology so it could be applied in the civilian world. And uh, without, uh, excuse me, Thinsulate. Thinsulate started with the Navy. And they, they, they found the material, but they couldn't make anything out of it. So they sent it to us and said, hey, could, this stuff really works good as an insulator, but we, it falls apart. So they gave it to us, and we made it so it didn't fall apart. And the rest is history. So, uh, yes, uh, very much. Uh, we talk to the Navy people almost every day on one subject or another. Okay, just a, a quick uh, uh, answer for Mike. Uh, he had a question about uh, the zippers that I was just talking about. Um, if you do send your suit, dry suit in for repairs, um, that the new zipper, it's the same style and everything as the old zippers, and that can be uh, used as a replacement zipper when your current zipper wears out in your suit. So that can be done in repairs. Uh, yes, yes. If you if you send in your suit for repair now, you're going to get one of the new zippers. You can't. We don't have any old zippers. So when you send your suit in for repair, you're going to get a new one. Uh, the 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 new tape, the new tape machine uh, zipper. So we've had some um, comments on some other topics that we might that you might want to go over in the future. Um, one of them is the story of Blind Man's Bluff, um, and some people may not know what that is. Um, so that might be a good topic going forward in the future. Um, also, like maybe some of the history of some of the dry suit materials, like um, you know the CF2, CF2 under material. Yes, that's that's uh, stuff like that. CF2 material was a uh, failed experiment. It was a failed experiment, but uh, it had some characteristics. It didn't do the job I wanted it to do. But but when I said, you know, that's tough stuff. That's really tough stuff. Why is it tough stuff? You know, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, Blind Man's Bluff is a book. Uh, it, it was a bestseller for years. It, it refers to uh, the fact the United States Navy had, the United States government had as the most closely guarded secret uh, during the height of the Cold War was exist the existence of a couple of nuclear submarines uh, with diver lockout capability. The Sea Lab program was a cover story for that book. So if none of if any of you have not read that book, please read it. It has three sections in it. The first one is right about after World War II, uh, when they started using submarines to spy on the Russians. Uh, it's very exciting, but not important to diving. The second one is about Project Jennifer, which was the Russian submarine that tried to start World War III. Um, uh, and we made wetsuits for those guys, but that's all. But when it comes to the third part, which is the most of the book, it talks about nuclear submarines with diver lockout capabilities. And when the Russians would test something, a missile, it, it would either hit the rowboat or not. It would crash and break apart when it hit the water, fall to the bottom of the ocean. The Russians would go home, drink vodka and talk about it. Then we'd come by and pick up all the pieces and bring them home. And it goes from there in more exciting stuff than that. But Okay, what was the name of the book again, Dick? Blind Man's Bluff. Okay, I've got um, one here. I, I've got one here, here in, in the my book case. If you want to see a cover, um, and just to answer someone else's question, um, uh, our tours question is: the, Do we have the neoprene zip seals uh, for the neck? Um, that's currently not a product that we are producing. Um, okay. So, what we the the term we use for it is beyond silicone. Latex is a soft material that will, will adhere to your body. And like, for instance, if you have uh, uh, wrists like mine that have the, the, the uh, tendon sticking out, the latex uh, matches that very well. But it, it, 
if you're in Southern California in nine months, they rot. I don't care what you do, they're gonna rot. You can take them out and, and put them in a plastic bag and they'll last longer, but you can't dive them that way. Uh, then we, we, we made silicone ones. Well, silicone is gonna last in theory forever, but it's softer material, it tears a little easier. And to me, they stick and I don't like the stickiness of, of them. So then, then we're experimenting with something we call Beyond Silicone. It is a synthetic mixture for sure. It does have some silicone in it, but having silicone in it, um, uh, everything's got silicone in it. So there's millions of, of combinations for that. But uh, right now we're having some wrist seals made uh, that will fit in zip seals. We can't get the next seals to work yet we, because when, when you're injection molding something like that, you have what's called a shrink rate. <coughs> you put it in the mold, it's hot when it goes in. When you take it out and it cools, it shrinks. Well, the shrink rate in this stuff has to be extremely, extremely small so that they will all fit together. And right now we can't get the next seal to fit like that. But we are gonna be making new molds and that will be a product we, well, it depends. When, because we're having them made in Italy, um, and I don't know when Italy's going to get back to work, but uh, we 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 hope to have them by the end of this year. We our original schedule had them to be done by the end of this year. Okay, so we're getting close to the our 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 limit. Well, not limit. We can actually go longer, but I want to try and keep everyone's time budget in a timely fashion. Um, so just a couple more things. One one quick question. Um, uh, have someone here is a, a NOAA diver for a number of years, and do you do we still interact with NOAA um, as, as far as like I know that we do stuff with them, but uh, do you have any take on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, we we sell a lot of suits to NOAA. Uh, if we go back in time, uh, NOAA uh, used to make all their suits out of foam rubber. Well, that's dry suits out of foam rubber. Uni suits primarily was what they were using. And when they started using ours, uh, they said, well, look, we don't need to wear BCs anymore because it, you're now wearing a dry suit. And I said, no, 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 you have to ha wear the, the dry suit, uh, I'm sorry, the BC for a backup. They said, well, we don't wanna do that because it makes us more bulky. And I said, no, I, I don't want you wearing my dry suit out there with us. So the result was Noah quit buying our suits. And I wouldn't back off that. Anyway, today that's all changed. Uh, Noah now, as far as I know, we're the, we're their primary supplier. Um, but I'm, sh I'm sure individual divers can buy whatever they want. So, okay, so let's wrap this up um, for this week. Um, again, we're gonna do this again next Thursday at the same time. Um, we'll send out emails again, just like we did this week. Um, we'll also uh, post this on, on Facebook and Instagram and all that social media stuff. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out here. Thank you, Dick, for um, taking the time to um, to go through your archive of all the products, photos, and all that stuff. Um, and this was great. It was fun. Um, hope to see everybody next week. So okay. with and that. And tell me what you want to hear. Tell me what you want to hear. Okay. Thanks, everyone.